we have a problem, and we would like your help in trying to fix it. We are documentary photographers, and we recently returned from refugee camps on Chios Island in Greece. We partner with NGOs to document their work, and this was our second trip to the islands this year. We were there during the bitterly cold winter in January, and then again during the blistering summer in July to document the lives of people living inside the camps. The United Nations has called the global refugee crisis the greatest humanitarian crisis of our time. You've likely heard the statistic that 65 million people have been forcibly displaced due to conflict or persecution. That equates to 24 people being forced to flee their homes every minute. At that massive rate of violence and destruction, by the time that we finish this talk, over 400 more people somewhere around the world are likely to become refugees. Here's the problem. The global refugee crisis continues unabated, but much of the world's attention has moved on to other topics. Many of those topics are important, but let's face it, many of them are not. How can you help? These individuals need people like you to use your voices to, to speak on their behalf. How? Number one, by being aware of the situation. And then, secondly, we hope you will use your compassion and turn it into action to help the most vulnerable people today. We'd like to bring you inside the Suda refugee camp. We have a very hard time comprehending what 65 million people means. Those numbers are staggering to us. And when you hear numbers and statistics like that, it becomes all too easy and comfortable to forget that these are human lives, men, women, and children, and not just numerical data. When we try to comprehend issues like that, it's important that we are able to break it down. As photographers, to break it down, we start one face at a time. There are two refugee camps on the island of Chios, the Suda camp, which you can see here, and the Vial refugee camp. We do not have any photos of the Vial refugee camp because it is located on a military base, and when we were there, we were specifically warned by the camp authorities that if we took photos of the camp or facilities, we would be arrested immediately. In years past, refugees would travel to their desired destination country and would seek asylum once they reached their target destination. However, in May of 2016, the European Union signed a referendum that forces refugees to be processed in the country where they first land. That means that refugees landing in Greece or wanting to go elsewhere have to remain in Greece while their asylum application is either approved or rejected. This map shows you where the island of Chios is relative to the rest of Greece and Turkey. It is one of the islands located closest to the Turkish coast, which is why it has become a hotspot for refugee boat landings. This is a complex global issue, and there is no clear solution. However, the fundamental factor to remember is that we're talking about human beings. We'd like to introduce you to a few of these individuals. This is Zafar and Rahana. They fled Afghanistan, seeking safety with their six-year-old daughter, Selena, and their one-year-old son, Mahadi. When we were in the camps, the one recurring request that we got from many people is that we tell their story to others. Many, want, many hope that there might be individuals out there that can help them with their personal situations. And others, they simply want the world to know that they're trying to find safety and they are not terrorists. The man in the blue jacket and the blue baseball hat is Asa, who's from Syria and goes by the nickname BKD. When we first met him, he introduced himself by saying, Yo, man, what's up? In near-perfect English with hints of a Brooklyn accent. We'd like you to meet him. Hey guys, my name is Abdullah Salman Abboud. I'm a Kurdish Syrian refugee, uh, AKA known as BKD, badass Kurdish dude. Are you here alone? No, sir, I'm here with my family. How many people is that? We're five, me and my mom, my brother, and my two sisters. My brother is 23, my sister is 24, and my other sister is 25, and my mom is 52. Okay. So what made you leave? The war, the war and the struggle and the things that are going on in our country. And we almost lose our life for like several times. That's why we flee the country. When you left Syria, were you in school? Yes, sir. I was in school, living my normal life. Just, just like, I had a dream on my mind. Like, 
my father once before, before he passed away he told me like he didn't he told he told my mom I should be a doctor because when he passed away I was only one month old so as, when the war came I had like put my dream on hold for like five years because I was 12. How did you learn to speak English? Uh, it was actually TV and people most of like family guy and the Simpsons and classic Americans. If there was something that your mother would want to tell leaders about what's going on, what would the message from your mother be to people? Of course, you'd be like, just like open the borders, open your heart for us. We like, we flee from like a country that, like everything we used to have is gone. We lost our house, our our friends, our home. Everything we used to have is gone, and we're just seeking like we're just seeking for peace and for a safe place and like. Just to live in peace, man. That's what we all, all we want. Like, start a new life and like give us the the chance and the potential to become like to have a great future for us. Thank you. You're welcome. In case you missed it, BKD stands for Bad Kurdish Dude. BKD is an intelligent and articulate man, and due to factors completely beyond his control, he has received only a seventh grade education. His mother was embarrassed to speak to us on camera because she didn't want to be seen having to live in a tent with her family in a refugee camp. The harsh living conditions, inadequate housing, limited medical services, and other unmet basic human needs take its physical, mental, and emotional toll on all refugees in Kios and elsewhere. People struggle to maintain a sense of dignity as the days and the months wear them down. When we were there in the winter, this man had been living in this tent for months. There were four men living in this tent. You can see three of the beds lined up right there to see how tightly packed it is. Seven men were living in this compartment in a larger tent. You can see the pillows lined up on the right wall to see how overcrowded it is. This room was made up of thin fiberboard walls. There is no privacy or security they have a blanket for a door. Because this room is part of a larger open structure with many other rooms, it is always noisy. There are always people outside on the other side of the, of the wall. It is expected that the Suda refugee camp will be dismantled and all the residents will be moved to the Vial camp by the end of this year. We're giving you a view into the Suda camp. But all refugee camps around the world face many of, the sim many of the same problems as we see here every single day. Before being categorized as a nameless generic refugee, Abrazak was a computer software programmer and website designer who speaks five languages and multiple computer languages. He was living in the Suda refugee camp and was hoping to go to any country that would be considered safe. The graffiti on the wall behind him says, we are refugees. No ISIS, no Turkey, no stay here. Please, we need help. Open minds, open hearts, open the border. When we were there during the summer, we also sat with another man, Ahmed, sitting in his tent that was baking in the midday sun. It was about 90 degrees Fahrenheit inside his tent, and we had set up a panoramic camera so that you could go inside and have a look around. Okay, guys, okay, guys. Boxer? Yes, I teach a boxer. You teach boxing? Yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Oh. Uh, every day, 10 o'clock a.m., I go to gym, bodybuilding, fitness. Okay. Every night? <laughs> yeah. 200 kilometers running. Really? Until airport. Okay. Uh, near the airport, we have a studio. You know? Yes. Yeah. You run to the airport? Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. far. <laughs> wow. Yes. And yes. How long have you been in Suda? Me? Yes. Nine months. Really? Yeah. Hi, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Who are these names? Uh, these? The, yes. Are they? This is my name. You're Ahmad? Ahmad, yes. And are the other ones? Oh. Um, A-H-M-A-D. A A okay. And who are the yeah, all, all of these other people are here now? No, no, no. They are not here. Yeah, it's not only me. All the refugees here. So five people live in this tent? Five yes, people? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, five. 
and have you very, very hot. So I'm still so hot everywhere. It's, you did not do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's better. Um, that's very smart. Who? Who? Uh, your shelves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very smart. Well, good luck. I hope things work out for you. I hope your lawyer can help you. Yeah. The reason why something as small as hanging shelves made out of fruit cartons is meaningful is because rats and even snakes can be found throughout the camps, making the individual's lives even more difficult. The rats will go into people's camps boldly looking for food. Every day, three times a day, residents line up at the food distribution area outside of the camp. When you're a refugee, refugee much of your life is spent waiting your turn. People receive monthly ration cards for both food and non-food items. These documents are incredibly important when you have nothing. This is where you get your drinking water. Sanitation is a constant challenge and risk to camp inhabitants. This is the men's shower and bathroom sink. There is no door to protect it from the elements, so in the winter, when it is cold and freezing, there is no comfort. Oftentimes, there is no hot water anyway. One of the residents told us that he would have to take a shower at 4 a.m. in the morning because um, it was just too cold outside, and that was the only time that they had hot water. People struggle to maintain a semblance of dignity as the days and the months wear them down. This is a makeshift barbershop that was set up under a tarp with a broken mirror and an electric heater for warmth. Everyday tasks are made significantly more difficult due to the lack of services and basic infrastructure in the camps. Here, a woman is washing her clothes in the outdoor communal sink. She washes each piece by hand in the cold, cold water. Women are highly vulnerable to the dangers of fleeing their homeland as well as once they are detained in a camp or in a new country. Another resident, a 17-year-old, unaccompanied minor told us, if you tell our stories to other people and they do nothing and they're just sad, it does not help us. We need people to take action and to help us. Thousands upon thousands of refugees have descended upon Greece's shores over the years, overwhelming much of the country and its resources. Nevertheless, Greece has stepped up and taken responsibility to help however it can. Greece is far from perfect, but at least they're doing something when so many other nations are not. This past winter in Greece was brutal and unforgiving. Temperatures fell to below freezing, and many, many people had to endure lengthy, miserable hardships. For many people, winterizing their tent meant merely lifting it a couple of inches off the ground onto wooden shipping pallets and covering their tents with plastic UNHCR tarps. It doesn't work. Sadly, Current reports indicate that the UNHCR and local authorities are no better prepared for the coming winter than they were for the last two. This is a communal tent where there were 10 people living in it, seven single men and a father with his two children. Rainwater and melted snow would seep into the fabric walls and also come into the tent from underneath, leaving everything inside the tents cold and wet. If you've ever slept in a tent overnight, you know that when you wake up in the morning, everything inside your tent is dripping wet with condensation. And if you were going to cover your tents in plastic tarps to winterize them, then there is no way for the tents to dry out during the day, which means that everything is wet and cold day after day. Dunya was four months pregnant when this photo was taken, and she was living in a tent with her husband, Amen. All of their possessions are behind them, a few blankets and a few clothes. And like everywhere else in the camp, their tent was cold and wet. Their floor is covered with blankets to protect them from the water that seeps in underneath. Here, in the vestibule of their tent, you can see the only items that they have for cooking and eating. Dunya, somehow, has to care for herself and her unborn child in these conditions. There's a saying that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men and women do nothing. 
Do we turn our backs or open our arms to the most vulnerable people today? We have the incredible gift of not living in a conflict or disaster zone ourselves. It could happen to us just as easily if the circumstances were different. So how can you help? These individuals need people like you to use your words and actions to speak on their behalf. We'd like to end on a positive note. So we're gonna share some more photos of one-year-old Mahadi, whose family you met at the beginning. Here he is with his father, Zafar. We each have to decide what side of history we want to be on. What we're asking is that you use your compassion and you demonstrate your compassion in action to help the most vulnerable pe people today. If you want to help refugees now, donate money, your time, and resources to groups active in locations where there is need. If you want to help with longer-term solutions, support organizations such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch who are trying to change policy. Find your legislators who are supportive of refugees and basic human rights and, and support them. Equally importantly, reach out to your legislators who are fighting against refugees and tell them that you want your country to do its fair share in addressing this crisis. Tell them, diversity makes us stronger, not weaker. Tell them, you are not afraid. We don't think we are naively optimistic on the future, but perhaps we all should start being just a little bit more. Thank you very much. Thank you.